Welcome back. Today I don't want to talk about the mighty A1335 precision hall effect angle sensor. Uh, I talked enough about them. Card to the basic video here and card to the faster details video here and links in the description. Instead I want to talk about something I already hinted on when I built this Lego Technic test jig for these sensors. Another card here and link in the description. There I made this <laughs> little joke here. Uh, that is <laughs> in the end probably whee, whee, since I will be using electric motors. Anyway, we're talking here about a dual engine control lever or throttle lever or whatever you want to call it. And it should be IP68. So just that you know what we are talking about in case that uh, <clears throat> crude Lego Technic setup there of mine didn't make it clear. We're talking about engine control levers and here are a few of probably hundreds if not a thousand examples that are commercially available. And of course we want to go for some uh, dual setup here for two engines. So there are a lot of commercial throttle controls available. Uh, of course they are. However, only very few are actually IP68 certified. And one of these products comes from a company named Glenn Denning. I assume it's the Rolls Royce of uh, engine controls for million dollar yards or something like that. Because uh, the cheapest IP68 offering from them, that's the Pro Grade Throttle Control, will set you back about 1700 bucks plus tax of course and yeah they are very nice uh, you can get them with different interfaces including canvas but they are also for my application a little bit too large so here the dual setup is about 17 centimeters in height about 7 inches and 15 centimeters wide so about 6 inches that's uh, yeah I want it smaller here we have another example from Rim Drive Technology, uh, which incidentally sells you everything <laughs> around electric propulsions of boats. And yeah, their uh, dual throttle control is much cheaper. Still extremely expensive, but cheaper at yeah about 730 euros plus tax. And yeah, I could actually go behind that design of their throttle here. Uh, nice and simple. Up to now we just looked at products for pleasure vessels, not for commercial vessels. So uh, just to be complete, we have a look here at uh, Quant Controls from Holland. I guess, or is that also Sneak Holland, the company? I have no idea. Uh, but they have here this nice, I, I really like that design, uh, the Buck G MK2. Uh, it's of course IP68. And uh, yeah, can I blow that up? Yeah, yeah, I like that design. I really like it. A little bit too complicated. Uh, for what I will be able to do, but um, still very nice. And here we have an offering also for commercial vessels from Lila's, uh, the LF90. And that's also a very simple design here. And it's not IP68, I just like the form factor because this is really nice and small. We have here some drawings at the bottom. So it's about 10 centimeters, so uh, four inches in height. It's about, yeah, total width is uh, 
96 millimeters, so also 10 centimeters, and uh, width uh, or depth is also 10 centimeters. So it's 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters or 4 by 4 by 4 inches. And that's the size I'm really, you know, aiming for. Now, I mentioned all the time IP68, but what does that really mean? So IP stands for Ingress Protection Code, and it's standardized by IEC 6529 as well as the European Norm 6529. I won't go through all the number codes. Uh, sufficient to say that the first digit describes the ingress protections against solid objects. For example, a two would mean uh, you can't put your finger into it. And a six means it's really dust tight, meaning there's absolutely no dust ingress, even if there is a little vacuum inside your device. And the second digit describes the protection against water ingress. And there you have, yeah, you read that often, I guess, IP67. And the seven here means that you can submerge your device in a depth up to one meter, so three feet, three inches, for up to 30 minutes. However, one meter means at the lowest point. So if I submerge my phone, for example, into the water, the lowest point of the phone can reach one meter water depth for a maximum of 30 minutes. The 8 in IP68 means that you can submerge your device in a depth of at least one meter, again, three feet, three inches, or more for an indefinite time. Please note that the standard doesn't define that or more part. That's up to the manufacturer of the device. Again, the depth specified by the manufacturer refers to the lowest point of your device submerged in the water. To give you a few examples here, your run-of-the-mill waterproof or water-resistant phone is probably IP67. While your submergible pump for that little nice fountain in your pond is probably IP68 up to 1 meter, 2 meter, 3 meters or whatever. So, how do you get a rotating shaft here watertight according to IP68? Well, the answer is simple. Uh, you build in seals. However, <laughs> that's not that easy and seals take up space. And as I mentioned, I want to build the whole thing small. However, we learned in the videos about the A1334 Hall Effect Angle Sensor uh, card here, link in the description, that these thingies really don't care about a larger air gap or, for example, 2.5 millimeter of ABS plastic between the magnet and the sensor. That will still work. So what we can do is actually enclose the whole of the electronics in a watertight case and yeah, basically accept a little bit of water ingress in the mechanics. As long as that's only uh, sweet water um, or rain or something, that's okay. But admittedly, if we're talking about salt water, you will get salt deposits over time inside here. <laughs> And you will probably at one point have to take it apart and to clean everything out. But for me, that's an acceptable compromise. Talking about <laughs> building the whole thing compact. 
So we had this uh, notch wheel here and the friction wheel here offset a little bit to each other because when we tested and experimented with the A1335, I wanted uh, to be able to do a 360 degree rotation here. However, if that thing works as a power throttle, we don't need 360 degrees. So usual values for the range of a power throttle are yeah about plus minus 60 degrees from the center position or a total of 120 degrees. So we will be able to yeah position these two yeah friction sources in line and make the whole thing smaller. I will probably do that with this little Lego setup here in the next video or so. Let's talk about another key element of this construction and that's friction. Here in my little Lego jig I have uh, two friction wheels here and the outer rim where the springs are pressing on that has a diameter of 17 millimeters. The springs themselves, I mean it's Lego, they are uh, quite weak affairs the spring material itself has a diameter of 0.5 millimeters. They are about seven turns and have a total diameter of five millimeters. And the whole thing here, all these Lego parts are made of ABS. Let's put a little bit of physics and math behind that friction thing. So basically friction is when you have yeah <clears throat> two surfaces sliding that's called the kinetic friction across each other. Uh, if they are just pressed together and you're measuring the force that it takes to get them sliding that's the static friction. But we're here just interested in the kinetic friction here. So what force do I need to apply sideways uh, to continue sliding here? Anyways, so we have a normal force Fn pressing from the top 90 degrees here, our two parts together. And then we have a force to apply here in parallel to get the, well, to keep the whole stuff sliding. And there is something called the friction coefficient. Well, in fact, there are two friction coefficients, one for the kinetic friction while you're sliding and one for the static friction when you're still not sliding. Anyways, the uh, normal force here coming down, pressing the whole thing together, multiplied by that friction coefficient micro k, gives you the force, the friction force you need to keep sliding. And for ABS, the material that uh, Lego is made of, that uh, friction coefficient is between 0.11 and 0.46. There are a lot of factors here, you know, the exact flavor of the ABS, the uh, finish of the surfaces and so on. But uh, yeah, just take two Lego bricks and slide them together and you see you can apply a lot of force here, uh, but you don't need a lot of force sideways uh, to slide them. Anyways, aluminum it a, is a whole other ball game. There your friction coefficient micro k is between, again dependent on the surface finish and stuff, between 1.05 and 1.35. Meaning if you press two aluminium parts surfaces together with a given force you need much more force here to slide them sideways. And in fact, if we take these numbers and take the worst case, uh, in my case, for, for me, worst case scenario. So let's say 
an ABS Micro K for, of uh, 0.46 and an aluminium a Micro K of 1.35 then the aluminium micro K is still 2.3 times larger than the micro K of ABS, meaning I get a whole lot of, or in the same construction, uh, 2.35 times at least more friction force here if I build all my friction parts out of aluminum. aluminum. Yeah, just for change, aluminum. <clears throat> but we are not talking here really about force, but about a momentum or torque. So we have here our little friction wheel, <clears throat> that one here, and there is pressing something, yeah, driven by a spring onto it. Yeah, that would be our normal force and then we have our friction force and our little wheel has a radius. And so the momentum we have here we need to turn our shaft is the radius of our wheel times the force here. Or if we take that formula from up here, it's the, uh, the friction momentum, mf, is the radius of our friction wheel times the normal force exerted by the spring times our micro k. Now I already told you that my Lego wheels here, our Lego registered trademark, uh, has a diameter of 17 millimeters. And in the worst case scenario here, for me the worst case, the micro K of aluminium is at least 2.3 times larger than the micro K of ABS. So in theory we can thin down our friction wheel or yeah this will probably be a, a, a massive aluminium shaft not with wheels on it just one shaft with one uniform diameter all along. Uh, we can reduce that from 17 millimeters divided by 2.3 our factor here to 7.4 millimeters and this would be the equivalent to our Lego setup, worst case. Maybe we get out a little bit more friction. Maybe we can use uh, stronger springs. Yeah, these springs here are pretty anemic. We'll see, but yeah, that's basically the math and the physics, physics you need to actually calculate the friction resistance here or momentum or torque. And that shall be enough for today. This was just intended as a little, yeah, you no know, project kickoff for the uh, dual lever throttle control or motor control, electronic, of course, and IP68. Where would the, uh, do we go from here? Oh, well, I guess I will first <laughs> change the little Lego jack here to make it a little bit more compact uh, to get to the actual measurements that I'm aiming for, you know, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters or 4 by 4 by 4 inches. I don't know if I can really do that using Lego, but uh, ah, we'll see. And... Uh, then I'll have to think how we build the whole uh, shebang together and what materials to use. I already mentioned the friction elements will be probably aluminum, but the rest, I guess I will take some plastic, maybe ABS, maybe nylon, maybe uh, or probably palm also. Well, I have to think about it. Uh, we'll see how the whole stuff will fit together. So, till next time, bye.